Hello, everyone. Welcome back to today's podcast. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's podcast, we're going to jump into a subject matter that was inspired by a recent collab I did with a YouTuber called Tom Foolery. If you guys are interested in that original clip, links down below. But we were discussing how do you know when someone's changed? Basically, how do you know when somebody is actually a different person or having a different relationship with their consciousness? Before we jump into the subject matter, though, I am drinking my strawberry passion fruit tea. This is the tea that I have been drinking for the last few months. I ran out. I went back to the tea shop. I grabbed some more. Best decision I made. Okay, with that said, I've got my notebook here. We're going to go through it together. In order to kind of convey my ideas, I'm going to use Avatar The Last Airbender. It's just too good of a show not to use. If you guys haven't seen the show, this might be confusing to you. If you haven't seen the show, I really just think you should. You should definitely get on that. Now, we're going to explore mostly Zuko, though I'll mention Aang slightly, but this is about Zuko, right? So what is introspection, right? It's a journey and a relationship you're having within, with the consciousness, you, right? This thing we call consciousness. Extrospection is that relationship you're having with the outside world. So there's existing, the relationship you have with yourself, my language here, and existence, which is everything outside of yourself. And when you're going on the introspection journey, of course, you're also going to have a relationship with yourself. So in the past, I've referenced people like Sneeko who obviously when I first watched his content, I was like, oh, he's probably like a four maybe. Obviously, I think he's probably like a three who decides to hop back into bubbles or maybe he's a four who hops back into bubbles. It's hard to say because I don't know him very, very well. Though we've talked a little bit in private, I haven't talked to him in a really long time and I don't really know his most inner thoughts. And it's really hard to level someone appropriately or to know where they are introspectively unless you really know their inner thoughts because so many of us are performative. As much as people like to say like, I'm very authentic on the internet. I have a real, I, I, I expose my real self online. I just think that's sort of a cognitive dissonance lie we tell ourselves. Even for myself, I'm a pretty private person. You know, we did like this meditation event on the Discord today. And even though I shared some of it, I didn't share all of it because again, it's very personal to the self. Introspection, knowing the self is intimate, right? Now, obviously we share with the appropriate people and in our life, people come in and out to help be mirrors for us to learn about ourselves, right? It's not that they give us the answers, it's that they hold up a mirror so we can actually see ourselves and then get the answer. So in Zuko's case, his uncle Iroh would have been the great mirror he needed. Now, of course, there comes a point in the introspection journey in which looking at the mirror isn't good enough. You have to then face the real version of yourself because the mirror is still a reflection and nobody can hold up the mirror for you. You have to see yourself for who you are without anybody's help. Now, this part of the journey is the hardest and it's why most people, even though they think they've done this, haven't. And I'll explain using Zuko. So, um, okay, so a baby is born. Stay with me here. A baby is born and that baby is having a relationship with its limited capabilities the best it can. Okay. I think babies are twos on my level system. Links down below. If you don't know my level system, it's called the levels. I already made an amazing video about it. If you guys haven't checked it out, I recommend you do. That baby grows up into a child and a child is sort of a, a subjective uh, construct, right? Like what is a child, right? We have an idea. We've made up rules about what a child is, but Let's say a child is somewhere between four and 17. We'll use that, you know, construct, though I, I really want you to use nuance as well. So child, what is a child? Well, a child at the age of five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten might be held to a different standard than a child at 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. I would argue that a 15-year-old and a 17-year-old are actually quite different. I would even argue that a 12-year-old and a 15-year-old are quite different. I would argue that a 5-year-old and an 8-year-old are quite different. Not only because they all have a develop they've all they're all at different development stages, but because of how society treats them. So not even just the relationship they're having with their existing, but how existence treats them. And then they grasp, grasp a concept of who they are within the world, right? So here's Zuko growing up as a baby who's really, really loved by his mother, a child who's really, really loved by his mother and sort of seen as pathetic to the father. And then you see Zuko's journey, right? Now we mostly see him as a 
um, a baby, a child, and a teenager in Avatar The Last Airbender. But of course, in Korra, we have insight into Zuko being an adult, which is a different version that he's having with his consciousness, right? The Zuko as an adult. Along Zuko's journey, we see the introspective changes, but we also see the loops. We see where Uncle Iroh isn't able to be the mirror for him, and so he goes in circles. So you have to ask yourself, if you're Katara and Aang and if, if you're the gang, you got to ask yourself, okay, is a Zuko I'm dealing with the same Zuko who on episode one wanted to kill the Avatar and capture him and do all that stuff? Or is he the changed Zuko that we thought we saw, but then betrayed us? Or is he the changed Zuko that actually changed? Because remember in Avatar The Last Airbender, Zuko starts off being a very violent, very antagonistic, a very stubborn, very rude, very just just so angry and just so un so not at peace that his uncle Iroh is ba basically like using humor to deflect the whole time eventually when Zuko and uncle Iroh go on the run and Zuko cuts off his ponytail he transforms in that moment into a different Zuko he's still angry uncle Iroh is still telling jokes but uncle Iroh actually shifts himself into more wisdom right? And Zuko shifts himself into more peace. It's not complete though. We see Zuko and Uncle Iroh try to adapt into the earthbending culture, try to have a tea shop, try to blend. They tried, I think Zuko, remember when Zuko actually went on a date that one time? He actually went on a date, right? Very, very strange. It was like he was trying on being that kind of person. Now we saw the transformation with Aang, of course, because Aang is the Avatar, but Aang himself, from the moment he found out he was the Avatar, changed from the boy he was before. And Aang, from the moment he found out was the Avatar, denied himself being the Avatar. So even though he was objectively the Avatar, he also wasn't the Avatar. He went and hid in an iceberg and denied his role in society, right? He took his existing, morphed it into something else, and rejected his... Um, I guess, obligation to existence. Now, of course, because he is the avatar, because he can control all four elements or he can bend all four elements, it kind of is a reality he can't escape. He doesn't have the, the sort of allowance to not be the avatar, but even Aang gets married, has a life, has kids and moves on as well as being the avatar. Avatars get to have lives, but they can't escape from being the avatar all the same. Zuko, can't exactly escape from being the Fire Lord's son, but there's even a point in which he almost gives to Azula this role he thought he wanted for himself, as if to say, I want to be someone different than this role that I was born into. It's kind of the message I think his mother kept sending him throughout the series, or at least through the flashbacks. You can be somebody different, but there is something scary about knowing that. So throughout the, you know, relationship we see with Zuko and Iroh, we see that Iroh himself also has to go on a different journey and become a different version of himself. A humorous uncle who was, a, you know, kind of a disgraced, you know, um, leader in the military to sort of a much more conscientious person to a much more wise person to eventually Korra, where I think he lands a five. But in Avatar The Last Airbender, even Uncle Iroh has to go through his own stages of transformation because of existence, Zuko, and his relationship to this boy that he loves and takes care of, right? Now, okay, as we go through, we have to ask ourselves, right? How do you know that you've changed? How do you know if somebody else has changed? These are two separate questions, but the answer is the same. It's the relationship you're having with your own consciousness. Zuko says to himself, why am I so bad at being good? And as Zuko is like really like struggling with himself, why am I so bad at being good? It's because he doesn't have a fun fundamental understanding of his own consciousness. He wants to be good, but then he's struggling between the part of him that wants to be a part of something bigger than him, which is his obligation to the Fire Nation. And then a part of him knows he's been this thing his whole life and it's worked out pretty good, but also like he kind of wants to be someone different. He wants to be someone who can hang out with the gang. But the gang is run by the Avatar and the Avatar is kind of a peace bringer. That's a very opposite to the fire, right? Which is why Aang and Zuko have their really great moments of being sort of complementary to one another, the yin and the yang, okay? So again, when we ask ourselves, how do I know if I've changed? How do I know if somebody else has changed? You know, eventually, after gathering tools of introspection, how to judge somebody else by how you judge yourself. Do you know that you've changed? How do you know you have? I had this conversation with Tom Fullery and it was a really great 
dive into what is change. For me, change isn't just making the action. That's the beginning stage. So when Zuko decides to run the tea shop with Uncle Iroh and he attempts to go on a date and he attempts to smile more, he's making the outwardly changes, but the internal is still in conflict. And since the internal is still in conflict, he what? He gives into temptation when Azula gives him an opportunity to come back to the Fire Nation. Zuko thinks for a moment he has done it. He has changed. Uncle Iroh for a moment believed it. Zuko changed. Aang, Katara, everybody literally thought Zuko changed. But Zuko knew he hadn't changed. He knew deep down in his consciousness he had not changed. He knew deep down that he was still, still eager for father's blessing. So when Azula gives him an opportunity, what does he do? He crumbles under the temptation because he did not build a foundation to his change. He only changed on the outside, which felt pretty good and got him a bunch of gold stars and dopamine hits, but he hadn't actually changed. His beliefs hadn't changed. His values hadn't shifted. He hadn't actually become a new person. So why eventually do we allow Zuko's change and accept it? because it becomes real eventually. Now, everyone is on a journey, and especially if you're on a journey through recovery, whether it's like drug addiction or any addiction or maybe mental health or just bad character, right? Those things don't always overlap. You can be an addict without a bad character. You can have bad character without being an addict, right? So those things don't overlap, but let's just say you're struggling. And you say, I know I am not X because I no longer do X behavior. I would ask you to dig deeper. Are you the actions you take, are you the thoughts you have, or are you the ideas you believe, or are you the, again, you can do the right things, but if internally you are thinking about doing the wrong things, whatever that means to you, you are contemplating it, planning it, hoping it, what are you really? You want to have a relationship, a symbiotic relationship between the actions you're taking and the, the beliefs you hold. Thoughts are interesting concepts. We've talked about this on the live shows before. Thoughts are Like you are not your literal thoughts. As somebody who suffers from intrusive thoughts, I know they're just intrusive. I know they're not real. They're not me, Brittany, sitting here and thinking, ah, yes, I want to do this. No, the Brittany that I am doesn't want to do this and I don't do it. It's symbiotic. It works together. And then on top of that, so those two factors, my real thoughts and my actions, they coincide. I have these intrusive thoughts that show up and I look at them and I'm like, oh, interesting. Why is that happening? And I get to examine them and pull them apart and meditate on them, but they're not real. They're trauma, right? That's like held in my body or held in my subconscious that pops up once in a while, right? And they show up and they're like, "Mm." a lot of people have them. And for some people, it's like, their cause of suffering. And for other people, it's just like this interesting part of them, their deep psyche or brain that's like interesting to them. Now, I remember a time in my life when I thought my intrusive thoughts were me. And then I realized like, oh no, this is something I suffer from and with, but I can get better and then I can learn to observe them. They still impact me. I'm still a person that has like, I can feel like, you know, I'm still, I can still sometimes like, oh, and feel stunted by my intrusive thoughts, but at least now I can observe them and watch them and be like, oh, what an interesting phenomenon that's happening. I wonder why that's happening. And even though I might be a little paralyzed for a moment, you know, I can get through it and I don't think they're who I am because I don't think that. Like all my intrusive thoughts are really silly and unnecessary and not rooted in any value system I have or any reality I've ever done or engaged in in a real way. And if I have in the past, it was because I was suffering from my intrusive thoughts, not because I really wanted to do those things, but I did them. And so in those moments, there's something else happening. There's the physical reality confirming the intrusive thoughts, but they they don't have a symbiotic relationship. I thought them, but I didn't want to do it, but I did it anyway right? Because when I am suffering, when I was the most mentally ill, I'm not evoking my free will. I'm moving completely off of my feelings, my biology, my what my brain is thinking it should do. When you have a relationship with your consciousness, when you're being introspective and not just coping, okay, when you're being introspective and not just coping, you're having a radical relationship with your consciousness. You are saying to yourself, not only do I think this, but I'm going to act with action because I think this. And it's not, again, don't get distracted. Your thoughts are separate from what you're thinking. Your thoughts are things that happen in your brain. Your thinking is with intention. When you're thinking with intention, you are you are literally having a conversation with yourself intentionally with focus. Okay, Brittany, today we're going to work out. 
and I need to do that versus imagining myself working out and then not doing it. I'm not thinking. I'm just imagining. When I'm thinking, I'm planning. When I'm planning, I'm executing. These things all have to work together. So when Zuko says, I'm the Fire Nation prince, I stand up to the avatar, I must get him. Those aren't even his thoughts. Those are his ideas that were given to him in order to win the approval of his father who had disowned him. They're not even his thoughts. He doesn't care. We don't even know if Zuko cares about the avatar because if you look back on his childhood with his mother, of course, Zuko had no relationship to the avatar. He was just a kid, right? Until he got disowned and was given this chore by his father, right? This chore by his father. He never had a relationship to the Avatar. So his relationship to the Avatar isn't even his own. It's his father's. But he's fulfilling it, thinking it's his own, and adapting it into his life. Until he lets go of the pursuit of the Avatar in a real fundamental way, giving away the thought and obligation his father had given to him and implanted in his brain, does he then choose to transform into a different person? Until he chooses to no longer be subject to his father's beliefs, his father's bubble into his own, until he decides to actually live for his own consciousness, he doesn't fundamentally change as a person. So again, when you're observing people and you're saying, did they change? It's really you. You're the one who's observing them and saying, did I, do I understand transformation? Do I understand change? Right? Like I can look at someone what did I say when Sneeko came out as a Muslim? I was like, this isn't real. And then Sneeko came out making fun of Muslims, right? Because it's not real. How do you know when someone is really something? There is a specific symbiotic relationship that happens between what their thoughts are and their actions are. It's why I often am very critical of people who identify as religious people. Because I'm like, you're not really though, right? Like if you are religious and you say, I'm Catholic, but I'm pro-choice. Like, are you Catholic? Or are you like conflating are you saying I have a relationship with God that I call Catholicism? If you're not following the tenets of Catholicism, if you're not following the tenets of Islam, are you really that thing? Or are you just identifying as that thing, right? When it comes to belief, when it comes to what you claim you know, the question is what's the relationship you're having with it? So when Zuko says, I know myself, right? I'm the prince of uh, the Fire Nation. I'm here to get Avatar. But then he has to have a transformation which leads him to asking, why am I so bad at being good? He's asking himself an introspective question. Who am I and why don't I know? Why don't I know? When you see people on the internet who are having a relationship with themselves, you can see them go from really introspective to back to not being introspective and you can see them fluctuate. And you're always wondering like, what are they really thinking? What are they really struggling with? What are they really in turmoil with? And you're hoping that you'll understand like where they're going, but really what you're accepting within yourself is that they're on the journey. And that's how you can judge them. I know that certain people I'm observing haven't really changed because their actions don't work. If somebody comes to me and says, Milo Yiannopoulos was a great example. He like came out as a Catholic. Milo Yiannopoulos came back as like a Catholic and it was a grift in my opinion. I remember my mother calling me and saying, do you know Milo is is basically pretending to be Catholic. I was like, I know. Like, yes, he has an interesting story. And yes, but even even my parents are like, is this real? Because there's a realness to a real conversion. There is a realness to a real conversion. And no, Milo is like a performative Catholic. He's not really acting within the the tenets of religion, Catholicism. He isn't supposed to be perfect at it, but there hasn't been a real conversion. When you watch other people who have like truly converted, like Michael Voris is a gay YouTuber who's actually a practicing Catholic and is a homosexual. And he follows the tenets of Catholicism within his homosexuality. And to such a specific degree, you can tell it's a real conversion. You can tell it's a real religious experience he's having, real being the construct of the bubble of religion, of course. But I'd be like, oh, yeah, that's a real Catholic right there, right? He's really doing the things. I might disagree because I'm a secularist, but I don't doubt his Catholicism. With Milo, I doubt his Catholicism because, again, there's a real conversion to be had. There's a real relationship with the consciousness that is called a real shift. So, again, when you say to me, like, how do you know they've changed, you know, for real, it's not just their actions. It's not just the end result. It's the relationship they're having with those actions. Are they doing it because they really believe it? Or are they doing it because it's convenient? Are they doing it so they don't get shunned? Are they doing it out of shame? Are they doing it because the world expects it of them? Are they doing it because they want to blend? Okay. If you're doing it because you 
honestly believe it, it is very true to you and it coincides with your actions, then we can talk about real change. So throughout the series, Zuko is going through this introspective journey and it is very difficult for everyone to decipher what stage he's at, especially himself. He himself cannot know. So how could we, right? If him not knowing isn't a sign, I don't know what it is, okay? If you're observing a person and they say, oh, I know it's very wrong to steal um, something, uh, uh, steal from old ladies. I know it's very wrong to steal from old ladies. It is so wrong. I'm going to make a living telling people not to steal from old ladies while I continue to steal from old ladies. Like, I know it's wrong, but again, like, I'm going to keep doing it. Is that a person that's like actually realized the wrong of their ways or is that a person who hasn't really genuinely accepted it's wrong because what or who or what kind of a person as a person who thinks it's very very wrong to do something and then does it anyway do they really think it's that wrong I would argue that they actually don't think it's that wrong but they think if they don't say it's wrong then the bubble will shame them so again is it wrong if it is wrong, you shouldn't do it. Now, wrong is subjective and on a spectrum. I think it's wrong to steal. I do. But at the same time, I'm definitely a pirated music. Hello, LimeWire. And I've definitely pirated movies. And I mean, weren't we all 15 with LimeWire at a time? And then I've definitely stolen food for survival. And I definitely love the movie Aladdin. So we're all having a relationship with the word wrong. And again, when I talk about values, this is where this comes into. So I don't have a value that says like, do not steal. I have a value that says be honest, but the honesty is predicated on the context of the situation. Because I think we're just like evolved animals on a planet. I think the relationship you're having with introspection and change is dictated by your relationship with your values. And I think the change is consistent with the actions you engage with. So for myself, one of the ways I know that I have fundamentally changed it as a person is obviously I don't date the kind of the same kind of toxicity that I used to date that's like a really good example throughout my dating in my 20s I would date pretty toxic people myself at the time was pretty toxic and by toxic I'm not casting like a big judgment I mean I've never cheated it I've never hit a partner I've never you know done really atrocious things to my partners I think the worst thing I've ever done is maybe like belittle them in public because I thought they were wrong and they were wrong, but maybe I could have saved that for later. You know, I've done some things that I, I wouldn't do now, but I've never really truly been like a horrible person. Okay. So I know that enough, but I haven't been the healthiest. So for me, when I say toxic, I mean unhealthy and I want to be the healthiest I can be. And I know that I am healthy now because I don't go, I didn't go back to dating my pattern of unhealthy. I didn't go back to trying to save people. I didn't go back to dating people that weren't ready for marriage. I didn't marry somebody that I wasn't truly, um, that I didn't truly know and believe was like the right, the right person for me, meaning he had good character. He had a good relationship with his values. He had a good foundation when it came to reality and him and I can, could mesh together our lives without being unhealthy. So much of my previous life was so unhealthy that I knew when I repeated that pattern, like breaking up and getting back together and breaking up and getting back together, I hadn't broken my pattern. But because I was getting better with my mental health along that journey, I thought, well, maybe my mental health getting better can coincide with my choices getting better. And that is true. The more I did in therapy, the better I got with philosophy, right? Because what's therapy without philosophy? The more I was healthy, the healthier I got, the, the, the less amount of time I spent with unhealthy people, which means that I eventually eradicated unhealthy dating partners from my dating pool on date one. It meant that if I was on a date with somebody and they were in any way showing that they were not on an introspective journey when it came to health, um, then they would be disqualified. Now, it didn't mean they had to be perfect. It didn't mean that they didn't um, they were without struggle. It didn't mean that they were, um, you know, somebody who, who never struggled or something like that. It meant that they didn't have a handle on their struggle. So, you know, I'm not a perfect person. No one's a perfect person. So it's not about perfection. Zuko's certainly not perfect. But when Zuko has a transformation and him and May have their little romance, you know, and they have their relationship, they're not dating each other because they're perfect. They're dating each other because they've both dealt with their own stuff. Even May says to Zuko, you need to deal with your stuff. And they come together, not because they're perfect people, but because they've dealt with enough of their flaws that they're not going to make the other person suffer because of them, right? That's what I do in my marriage. It's what I recommend you do in yours if you 
want to live this way. But May and Zuko have a moment where Zuko makes his stuff her stuff. And she says to him, like, you need to get it together. Like, I already have my own stuff to deal with. I already have my own toxic family, my own healthy background. You have to learn to deal with it. And he sits there and he's like, oh, and what does he do? He abandons May because he can't be there for her. And she gets it because she's a little further ahead in her introspection journey. She looks at him and she knows and she lets him go. And then that is a healthy moment between the two of them, right? Where then Zuko can take that and try to take it into a more healthy perspective moving forward. But he fails. He comes back and forth. He has moments of doubt. Doubt. Fear is the root of all evil, right? He has so much doubt in himself that he can't find a foundation for his consciousness. So he can't change. When you doubt, when you're fearful, when you're afraid of being laughed at, when you're afraid of being wrong, when you're afraid of anything to such a degree that it stuns you, and then you put on this front that I'm the Fire Lord's son and I'm Zuko and I'm the prince, you know, you can drown in that cognitive dissonance, right? <sighs> Let's see. Okay. Okay. So, of course, the three questions we're going to ask ourselves to kind of answer this. Okay, hold on. Let's take a drink. Hello. I am monologuing. Okay. Who are you? What are you? And what do you think? These are all verses. So, who are you? What are you? And what you think, right? So, this is, you know, okay. Who are you? Zuko the consciousness is... Yes, everything that existence tells him that he is. But what if existence wasn't there to tell you who you are? You have to know who you are without the world telling you who you are, which is really difficult. So you start with yourself. You identify the consciousness that um, is me. So I would say me, Brittany, me. But I wouldn't say Brittany because Brittany is a name someone gave me. So I'd say me. And then I go, cool, what is a me? Uh, me is a person with this kind of hair and this kind of body and this kind of face and this kind of sound coming out of her mouth and this kind of, okay. Then I would go, okay, I'm a me. And then I would go to the outside world existence. I'd be like, hi, what do you see when you see me? And they'd be like, oh, I see a girl. I see Brittany, my daughter. I see my sister, Brittany. I see somebody with curly hair. I see so on and so forth. And then I take that back to myself and I go, okay, so I started with myself, I'm a me, I go to society and then I come back to myself and I say, okay, so there's these words that people use and give to each other to put each other into boxes, which is also helpful because categorization is helpful. But does this categorization actually explain the consciousness, consciousness that is me? What is this concept of me? Wait, do me exist? What is a me? What's this word we use called me? How do I know that I'm an individual consciousness? Am I even an individual? What does it mean, right, to be me? Are dogs individual dogs? Are deers individual deer? When you say a flock of penguins, do you really recognize that each penguin is a different consciousness? Each penguin is a different identity of penguin, that they are not all the same penguin? That's how you need to look at humans. Are we all just humans in the way that you look like ants? Like if you look at a group of ants, are they individual ants or are they just ants, right? So what does it even mean to be me, right? So who are you? Okay. What are you? Oh, no, I'm sorry. What you do. Sorry. My bad. What you do. Okay. So what do you do? What actions do you take and why, right? So what actions do you take and why? And that coincides with what you think. So your action. Okay. So who you are, what you do, and how you think about what you've done. Now, some people do and then think. Some people think and then do. And some people try to do both at once. And some people kind of, we all go like this. I go like this. You go like this. The more we can think before we do, I think the more harmony we have. But if you think before you do, you're also held to a higher standard because you made the decision in like in free will consciousness. Oh my gosh, Brittany, did you do this on purpose with intention? because you thought about it or oh my gosh no I just did that instinctually I did that out of reflex I did that in the moment I didn't even think before I did so I can't be held to the same amount of responsibility maybe or depending on how you think about life the gang on avatar 
might look at Zuko and say, Zuko did all of this, therefore it can't be forgiven, right? It's not like Zuko serves time for being the Fire Lord's son at some point, right? Avatar The Last Airbender is about radical acceptance and forgiveness. Zuko never has to pay time in jail for what he did as the Fire Nation's son. That's how this world would, like our construct would see it, is like they'd be like, he needs to pay. He needs to pay for what he did as the Fire Lord's son because he was on the losing side. But what Avatar The Last Airbender is trying to teach you is we're all the Fire Nation. Don't think that Ba Sing Se did not also manipulate their citizens to think a war wasn't going on. No matter how you see it, every nation had its flaws. Every nation was the fire nation because we are all the same. We're people. People are people everywhere. Firebenders were, no, earthbenders were turning in earthbenders to firebenders. We were turning in our own people to the bad guys. Who are the bad guys? The bad guys were people who were born into their own bubble who thought of themselves as the good guys. It's why Aang has that whole arc where he goes into the Fire Nation school and is a student. And what we're supposed to take from that, no, we're not supposed to take from that season, guys, that, oh, America's the Fire Nation. We're all the Fire Nation. We're all the Fire Nation. Every time I hear from people and they're like, oh, my God, are we the baddies? You know, that whole skit, are we the baddies? We're all the baddies. The lesson we're supposed to learn from something like Avatar or something like philosophy is that we are all the baddies and we're all the goodies. We all think we're doing good even though we're doing bad. And we all think we're doing bad even though a lot of us are doing pretty good. Isn't that a complex? How many of you all have that complex of like, I am such a horrible person. I'm a bad person. Girl, what have you ever done in your life? What is your worst crime? Go ahead and tell me. What is your worst crime? Go ahead and tell me. Why do you think you're such a bad person? And then the irony is that people that are sitting here chronically cheating, abusing their children, maybe throwing innocent people in jail, maybe even assaulting people, they're like, I'm a good person. And I'm like, dude, we have to find balance. Not everyone in the Fire Nation was what you would say is a bad person, right? Because that's what they're trained to be like. Every time I see American youth go like, America's the bad guy, we're all the bad guy right? Name a nation that wasn't built off the slavery or subjugation of another, another, like another people, right? Name a country that didn't have conflict and war. Name a country that has a perfect prison system. Name a country that's perfect. You can't. At least not very large countries, right? Maybe in those smaller little countries, they're doing pretty good. But even then, if you zoom in close enough, something's going on. The lesson we're supposed to take from this is that yes, people can change and redemption can happen, but it's only a relationship the individual is having having with, it, with themselves. When we get stuck and we feel, feel pulled down by what other people are doing and how they're seeing us, we're not giving ourselves a chance. It's why I don't believe in mob rule. It's why I don't believe the majority is always right. It's why I have a really hard time with people judging people because again, I wanna categorize people appropriately. I don't wanna miscategorize them as better than they are or worse than they are. I just wanna see them for exactly who they are, right? So I don't think you're evil if you do this, but I think you could be exhibiting evil tenants if you do this, maybe. What is evil? It's such a construct. And then I think you could be doing this for this reason. Again, when I'm observing people, but mostly myself, I just wanna make sure I'm categorizing myself correctly because when you're wrong, it is going to impact you in a much worse way than if you're right and you just have to be a little embarrassed for a while. It is better to be wrong and embarrassed than wrong and create a cognitive dissonance so large that you never heal or get better, okay? So going back to Zuko, he's a person that we watched transform many times over. We had a lot of really good moments with Zuko where he exhibited a lot of bad behavior and a lot of good behavior. He lied for good reasons and lied for bad reasons. He made friends and betrayed friends. He made a relationship with himself, himself and then betrayed it. And then eventually he learned to be his own person, which is very difficult to do, right? And when you become your own person, you can see in a, in a limited or a not limited way your relationship with existence and other people. So in some ways Zuko saw that, oh my gosh, like the Fire Nation was wrong. But he didn't think everyone in the Fire Nation was bad. And one of the issues I see with people in our reality, like reality, not a cartoon, is they will say, oh my God, like we've done really bad things. We're bad. Stop. Just because they're doing bad things and these people and we've done doesn't mean we are literally always forever bad. Okay? 
It means we're on the journey. And then you have to be open with boundaries about how you're interacting with those consciousness and the world around you and the people around you, but mostly yourself. So how do you know if people have changed? You have to know what change means. Change isn't just the physical action you're taking or the thoughts of wanting to change. You can't think, oh my God, I love working out. I go to the gym every day in my head and you have never stepped foot in the gym. I knew a guy who got a dopamine hit just showing up to the gym, hitting the I went to the gym on his app and then going home. Legit. He was like, I would go to the gym, hit the app, said I was at the gym, then I'd go straight home and eat food. And I'm like, holy shit. He was like, yeah, I did that. And I was like, what was that like? He was like, dude, I just wanted the dopamine hit. And I was like, no wonder. That's so interesting versus the people who go, the people who do. You see the difference. The difference is in how they live their life and who they have around them. So when someone says to you, oh, yeah, I've been sober. I'm clean. I've been, uh, I've been clean for six months. Oh, great. You should see that in their actions. You definitely shouldn't be hearing that they got a, you know, a, a DUI in the last six months. If somebody says, I've been sober for six months, but recently had a DUI, does that mean they've been sober for six months, guys? No. If somebody says, oh yeah, like I only want healthy relationships. I don't date people that are toxic. And then they're bringing home people that are falsely accusing parents and calling CPS and forging pictures of bruised children to get revenge on somebody. We just saw that on Abba and Preach. Okay. Links down below. Do are they really not dating toxic people anymore? Okay. People tell you who they are, but you yourself, you tell yourself who you are more than anything. you know. And you know when you see it in other people. The only way someone can trick you is if you literally do not pay attention to every detail and you don't ask the right questions and you don't have the tools to really see a lie because you're so good at lying to yourself. You don't know even know when you do it. You know when you lie to yourself, you should know when people do it to you. It's not saying you can't be tricked. I'm saying this is a skill you have to learn. You have to learn the skill of recognizing when you lie to yourself so you can recognize when people lie to you. Because a lie sounds very close to the truth, guys. A good lie sounds very close to the truth. I've changed. Look, I've gotten all these people out of my life. That sounds right. It looks right, but it also is wrong because this thing here and this thing here and this thing here... You know when you're lying to yourself, whether you admit it or not. And that, that is the skill. When Zuko says, why am I so bad at being good? Because you're very bad at this moment of radically accepting that you are bad. And so you don't even know how to be good. Because how, how bad could I be if at least I know I've been bad? Pretty bad, you know? But also, I believe in redemption. I believe in redemption so hard. It's what I hope my work helps you realize is that you're not the same. You don't have to be the same person for the rest of your life. You can become a radically different person. You can get rid of, you can kill the part of you and send them off to their little space and time, the part of you that was attracted to toxicity. You do not have to be a person that spends the rest of your life being attracted to toxic toxicity. You can literally reform the relationship with you of the relationship you're having in toxicity within yourself so you're not attracted to it in others because honestly like we're attracted to other people because we see a part of ourselves in them so when you look at someone you say I'm really attracted to a part of them is it the toxic part because that means the toxic part is living within you that means you right when Azula gives Zuko the opportunity to come back to the fire nation she appeals to the part of him she knew was still alive the part of him that still wanted dad's approval until Zuko broke from the chains of his father's approval, he could not be a different person. He could not make a different decision. It was too tempting. It was too tempting to finally fulfill this narrative he had about himself. It was too tempting. And so he fell. You have to be a literal different person in order to grow. But of course, you need the conflict of the world challenging your curtain self but mostly the challenge of you wanting the change, needing the change. You have to challenge yourself. Okay, so how do you know you're introspective and you're not just coping? You'll know because you know right now that you're coping. You know it's so hard. You know when you're coping. You think you're smart. You think you're introspective. Then call your own self out on your own bullshit. If you really think you're smart, then you know you're coping because we're not perfect 
And everybody got to cope sometimes. Everybody. Everybody. Okay. All right. That's my podcast for today. I hope it helps. If you have any comments or questions, leave them down in the sections below so I can make other podcasts that coincide with this next week's podcast, unless something better comes along. But I think this is the subject matter. It has to do with borderline. And how do you know it's your borderline just like deceiving you to like split or see something that's not real? And how do you know when you're right? And how do you learn to trust yourself? If you guys have comments or questions in relation to that, leave them down in the sections down below. Because I will tell yourself as somebody with borderline who has gotten better, who's in remission and in recovery, and as somebody who's on the other side of it, even I have moments where I'm like, is this my borderline or is this correct? And I have like a check sheet and I have a rule sheet. I like go over my checklist to try to figure it out. I put tools in place for myself and I just want to give you guys as many of those as possible in case they help you. So if you have any comments or questions, please let me know and I will see you next week for that podcast. Okay, bye. In my head, in real life, I'm dead. My belly's being fed and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine. Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking. Yeah. Sick of reaching out for the truth and living life as a fool.